In your book, you talk a lot about the uh, uh, the first, the second uh, conflict in Iraq and how we're occupying it right now, and you don't approve of it. Um, what do you think? Do you think the uh, initial invasion of uh, Iraq in the early 90s, the first conflict, was justified? Well, the first, uh, the, the second conflict uh, was just an outward, outward aggression. It was just, you know, it was, called, it was what was called in the Nuremberg Tribunal the supreme international crime, uh, which include, differs from other war crimes in that it includes all the evil that follows. So that's the second invasion. I don't see what there is to discuss about that. It's a total horror story. The first invasion is more controversial. interesting to look at. If you're interested, I've gone into the details, including the internal record, and shortly after, in a book called Deterring Democracy. Um, more has appeared since, but roughly the same story. Uh, what happened is that uh, in uh, uh, the United States was very strongly supporting Saddam Hussein, remember. Uh, that began in 1982 under Reagan. Uh, we have this thing called the terrorist list, which is just an outrage. Uh, it's a list invented by the government. It's not under any review. If someone's put on it, like say Nelson Mandela, there's nothing you can say about it. Uh, the Mandela case illustrates the way it works. But a very, and it's being used right now, remember. So that's being used to attack American groups and so on. The uh, uh, and one striking illustration of how it works was in 1982. Saddam Hussein had been on, the, Iraq had been on the terrorist list. But the Reagan administration wanted to support Iraq in its aggression against Iran, the bigger enemy. So it was necessary to remove Iraq from the terrorist list. So they were removed uh, shortly after <coughs> Donald Rumsfeld made a famous trip to Baghdad shaking hands with Saddam, Rangers for aid to be given, and so on. But there incidentally was a gap on the terrorist list then, so it had to be filled. So they decided to put <laughs> Cuba on the terrorist list. And the reason, presumably, was because Cuba was far and away the leading victim of international terrorism, which in fact had been expanding right through the late 70s and through the details. So that was the terrorist list. The U.S. strongly supported Saddam during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the Reagan administration even went so far as to block protests against Saddam's worst atrocities, the massacres of the Kurds, you know, Al-Anfal massacre, Al-Abja. The Reagan administration blocked any action, in fact tried to blame them on Iran, uh, basically won the war for Iraq. Uh, but by the end, Iran finally capitulated. Uh, after the war was over, the U.S. continued to strongly support Iraq. Uh, this is now George, uh, the first Bush, George H.W. Bush. Uh, he uh, uh, increased uh, uh, aid to Iraq. He actually invited Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States for advanced training in nuclear weapons development. That was 1989. Uh, goes on into early 1990. Uh, the Bush administration sent a delegation to Iraq, led by Robert Dole, Senator, Senate Majority Leader, you know, later presidential candidate, including Senator Simpson and other dignitaries. They went to, to Iraq to bring the president's greetings to his friend Saddam Hussein. The transcript of that meeting is available. And I urge reading it. Uh, they were basically informing Saddam that he should disregard the critics in the American press, we have this free press business, we can't shut them up. Uh, but, uh, but they said they would remove somebody from the Voice of America who was criticizing Saddam and so on. Uh, all of that was, I think, April 1990. A great friend. Uh, August 1990, Saddam made his first mistake. He either violated or probably misunderstood orders. and. Uh, invaded Kuwait. Well, there were all kind of reasons for that. I won't go into them. Whatever they were, he invaded Kuwait. Uh, very quick, 
the Bush administration immediately recognized that this is an opportunity, not only to switch sides, but to finally, you know, crush them. Uh, they liked it, but it's better to have somebody loyal. Uh, uh, Saddam immediately recognized he'd made a big mistake, and uh, within weeks he began to produce offers to withdraw. The, in Washington, you look back at the debates, the concern was, as Chief of Staff Powell put it, that uh, Saddam will withdraw and leave a puppet regime in place and all the Arab states will be happy. In other words, Saddam would do what the United States had just done in Panama. Look at the reports on Noriega today and you'll notice something's missing. How the United States got rid of Noriega in Panama. Panama, Noriega had also been a big buddy of the United States, but he also kind of uh, stopped obeying orders. They turned against him, uh, invaded Panama, uh, killed hundreds or maybe thousands of people, nobody counts when they're victims, uh, attacked the Vatican Embassy where Noriega was trying to get asylum, and finally came out, got him out of the country, took him to Florida, where he was tried and convicted for real crimes which he had committed while he was on the CIA payroll. Uh, like if you read the papers today, they talk about uh, how the family of Spadafora, one of his victims, are calling for uh, uh, compensation. They failed to mention that Spadafora was murdered while the United States was supporting Noriega under Reagan and in fact praising him for the wonderful things he was doing. That out of history again. Anyhow, they were afraid that uh, Iraq would do just what the U.S. had done in Panama, in, invade the country, install a puppet regime, and leave. Uh, the difference was that the Latin American countries were infuriated. They weren't happy about it, uh, but they thought that the Arab countries would be happy with this. Well, they wanted to block that. Uh, they wanted a chance to invade. Uh, uh, and in fact, if you look over the next couple of months, the media reporting is quite interesting. There were people in the government who were leaking, regularly leaking, uh, offers from Saddam Hussein to negotiate a withdrawal. And the press wasn't covering them. They were finally, they were being published, interestingly, mainly by a small suburban newspaper, the Long Island Newsday. It's a Long Island newspaper, which happened to be distributed in New York. So you could get a, the newsstands in New York would have a you know, cover of New Island Newsday with uh, Long Island Newsday with that big headline saying, uh, Saddam says, let's talk, U.S. says no. Well, you know, after that, the New York Times had to have a comment on page 28 at the bottom of a page the next day saying, you know, State Department denies rumors or something. But these things were almost certainly being leaked to the New York Times. Nobody leaks things to Newsday. And presumably they just didn't publish them, so they were leaked to Newsday. This went on for a couple of months. Uh, finally, by January, around January 1990, uh, Saddam made a pretty definite offer to withdraw on conditions which were in fact supported by about two-thirds of the American population. Withdrawal from Kuwait, total withdrawal from Kuwait, uh, in the context of a regional uh, a conference on security issues. Okay, that's code words for Israel's occupation of Palestine. So of course, the U.S. wasn't having any of that, and uh, that also bare potentially wasn't reported. A couple of lines here and there. And then the U.S. invaded, uh, crushed Iraq easily, uh, destroyed the infrastructure, uh, carried out a really brutal war. I mean, Iraq, of course, was here from Kuwait, but it looked as if that could have been easily arranged just by diplomacy and negotiations. Then comes the sanctions regime. That's a huge issue in the Arab world. Nothing here. Uh, after 9-11, polls here, kept them here about, you know, why did they hate us, that kind of thing. And they showed that one of the main reasons was the Iraq sanctions even among people very supportive of the United States. The sanctions were really murderous. They killed hundreds of thousands of people. 
They devastated the civilian population. They strengthened Saddam. They compelled the population to rely on him for survival. They probably pr protected him from the fate of other monsters, those I mentioned, who were overthrown from within. You know, Somoza, Marcos, the rest of them. Uh, he was protected from that. And this, this was known. Uh, the people who knew, mo the Westerners who knew most about Iraq, by far, were the two international diplomats who administered the Oil for Food program. Distinguished international diplomats, uh, Dennis Halliday from Ireland, Constance Bonnick from Germany, uh, very outspoken, uh, both resigned on grounds that the sanctions were, as they put it, genocidal. They had a lot of information about Iraq. They had investigators all over the country. They were getting all sorts of information, sending it back to the Security Council where the U.S. wouldn't let it be presented. Both resigned on grounds that the, they were genocidal. Von Sponek published a major book on it. I urge you to read it. It's called A Different Kind of War. Carefully documented scholarly account of what the sanctions were doing. I don't think it's ever been mentioned in the United States or England, I can find it, at least. Uh, that's what was happening. Uh, that protected Saddam. And then we get to the second invasion. Uh, so there's a lot to say about the first invasion. I mean, you can, you can argue about it. At least it's debatable, unlike, in my opinion, the second one. But I don't think it stands up for <coughs> scrutiny, and I didn't think so at the time for the kind of reasons I mentioned. You can check them out and see what you think. <laughs>